Welcome class to uh, my mini lecture on plate tectonics and the sea floor. Um, if you remember the last uh, mini lecture capture, uh, we ended with going over some seafloor topography. Um, and the basic take home message really for this lecture and that, that ending was that the sea floor has structure. Right, if we remember, we looked at a topographical map of sort of the whole globe here. We see similar topographical features, mountains and valleys and that kind of thing, um, as we do on land, just below the sea. So what this lesson is about is, what is the mechanism for that? And the answer is plate tectonics. All right, if we look at uh, a cross-section, um, the same one we looked at last last lecture, we see that if we look at a cross section of the ocean ba of an ocean basin, you know we can have a shallow shallow sort of coastal um, boundary between the continent and the ocean. We can have a steep one. Um, we can have these deep trench valley like trenches. We can have these big giant plains. Um, we can have mid ocean ridges, sort of underwater mountains. We can have mountains formed by volcanism, just like on land. And we can have these kinds of features sort of weathered away, what we call seamounts. Um, and this is sort of a squashed view, you know, this is usually stretched out over a much bigger ocean basin, but this is just trying to fit a lot of structure into one, one, uh, one figure. And the fact of the matter is that m the majority, one quarter of the Earth's surface is covered by these underwater abyssal plains. So much of the sea floor is just a large flat uh, expanse of, of nothingness, sort of. So plate tectonics. In, the, in history, um, it was essentially in the 1600s that Francis Bacon noticed that uh, once we began to start to map the, the continental coastlines here, he noticed that if you tried to put them together, the coastlines, like a, in, in, like a puzzle piece, they looked like they sort of fit together. Um, and it was not until we started to go out and look in, underneath the ocean um, beneath the surface and, and sort of get some of the some idea for what the topography of the of the um, of the margins the sea the, the oceans margins with the continents what they looked like that it made it look like they even fit it together even better it wasn't until 1912 though that Alfred Wegener uh, gave a big long lecture on how on his theory of continental drift that that the reason that the continents look like they fit together is because they do and it's because the continents have been have been drifting for forever um, and and the idea behind continental drift is that uh, one time ago 225 million years ago at one time um, there was one giant landmass one giant continent called Pangaea um, surrounded by one giant um, ocean that uh, that he called Panthalassa and that over the course of 225 million years um, these started to drift apart the continents started drifting coming apart just like puzzle pieces um, eventually starting to separate and um, 225 million years later, looking much like the, the, the different continents and, and the structure of the ocean as we know it today. Of course, everybody thought it was crazy at the time, um, but, but since then we have found some really great evidence. So if you put the continents back together into this Pangaea form, we start to see some pretty strong evidence that that, that was what exactly was happening. Um, and, and, and three of those uh, lines of evidence that really stand out are, you know, if you take mountain ranges from Europe and you line up Europe with North America, you can see um, specific features, specifically rock types and ages and dating, stretch, match up exactly. They line up each, like with each other just like they used to be a puzzle piece. Um, and the same thing with certain types of fossil records. Certain fossil plants um, are found in such distinct patterns and when you when you put the, the, the continents back together into Pan, Pangaea, you can just trace them from one continent to the other. It's very continuous. Um, and the same thing with some a few fossil reptiles. So this was very strong evidence and to, to what we now know scientifically to be correct. So what's the mechanism? The mechanism really is uh, based on how the Earth is made up. We should all be aware that the Earth is a solid sphere, at least I hope so. Um, but it's defined, it's broken up into very defined layers. So so the very center of the Earth is a solid core, the inner core of the Earth. Um, uh, but it is intensely hot because all of the materials that originally went into creating the Earth are under constant radioactive decay. And the energy given off by that makes the inner core 
very, very high energy. And so what that does is heat out the liquid outer core, which is the, the second layer of the Earth, so the inner core, the outer core. And the, the inner core is hot enough to melt this liquid outer core, which means it's movable. Um, then as you get further away, far enough away from the inner core, um, it's still pretty hot, but we have the entire mantle layer, the third layer of the Earth. And um, it's far enough away uh, from the from the center to be not quite so liquid. There are parts of it that are that are pliable and can move, but but it's not as liquid as the, the liquid inner core. Um, and then on the very outside layer of the, if we break the mantle into pieces, we break it into the mesosphere, which is hot and strong due to hot, but very strong due to the high pressure it experiences. The asthenosphere, which is the thin layer between um, between the very very surface of the Earth and the inner mantle which is weak and plastic so it moves, it's almost fluid, and then the lithosphere which is what we experience. We're standing on that, um, but it's very cool because it's towards the outside of the earth and it's, which makes it rigid and brittle. <coughs> so anytime you have a concentrated central heat source, um, you get cells that set up like this in what we call convection. So at the center of this heat source, the warm air becomes less dense and rises. As it gets further away from that heat source, the continually rising air pushes it away, and then it begins to cool and become more dense and sink again. If you contain this system, if you put it in, in some sort of containment, which the containment can be anything, um, you get this convection cell where you have the heat constantly rising, diverging away from itself in the, in the middle, sinking and converging here and I said the key words there right if when when these two areas go away from each other we call that a div divergent boundary or a divergence and when things come together like they are here to be reheated we call that converging convergence and those are important terms for you to know because we'll be talking about them within uh, several different context contexts in the course but you get this with a whole bunch of familiar, very familiar heat sources, central heat sources like a space heater in your house, um, the way the sun heats the ground, um, and the way that heat radiates off the earth um, is what sets up many different types of convection, but including our large-scale atmospheric circulation, and it even happens in a pot that you, where you boil water. And indeed, that's really what's going on within our earth every minute of every day. The core is heating the, the inner core is heating the outer core, the outer core is heating the, the movable parts, um, or the, the, the outer core is moving in a, in a, in a um, convection cell which pushes around the mantle in, uh, in, in more convection cells and this is in, 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 in essence is what's driving plate tectonics. Hot inner core, convection cells, right? Here's a divergence, here's a convergence, divergence, convergence, and what it does is drive the lower part of the mantle just like a conveyor belt moves it along and sets up different sets of divergence and convergences within the mantle which pushes the the brittle outer parts of the crust which form these plates and later on you can pause this if you want and take a look at at where these plates kind of line up um, and what some of the features are are called but if we zoom in on one of these plates we see that where there's this convection cell, so here's the here's the center of a convection cell and at the top is a convergence, at the bottom is a I'm sorry, a divergence, they're diverging away from each other, and then the, the bottom is a convergence, and what they do is push the plates, so here's one plate, right, a broken piece of crust, here's another one, and they push away from each other. So this is constantly newly forming seafloor, this molten material actually makes its way up in a volcanic-like activity, forms, hardens, forms new seafloor, and the old seafloor is pushed away, and, and this is what we call a divergent boundary, plate boundary. Right, so off the screen over here, we have a similar thing happening, and here another the edge of another plate meets the edge of this divergent plate in a convergence. So this is two meeting each other and converging. And only a couple of things can happen when two plates converge. One either has to be pushed below the other one, um, or they have to actually butt heads against each other and they start to, 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 to break each other and form, form mountain ranges. But if we look at the entire surface of the Earth and all the plates, it's made up of alternating convergent, divergent, convergent, divergent, convergent plate boundaries. The boundaries where the plates meet or either meet or go away from each other, right? Divergent go away from each other, convergent meet each other. 
and the and the the result is either certain types of mountain ranges that we call ridges in under sea. Um, some of the activity can cause volcanism off to the side of a of a convergent uh, boundary, which gives us some so, certain types of mountain ranges either in the middle of the ocean or on land. Right, like this this mountain range right here could be represented by the Rockies, um, the Rocky Mountains, and off our western coast. In the middle of a continent, we can get a divergent valley. Or in the middle of a continent, we can get another type of mountain ranges from a convergent uh, <coughs> plate boundary, just like the um, um, the uh, Appalachian Mountains on the east coast. And indeed, it's all those boundaries that make up the plates as we, as we as we know them today. Um, there are. Um, uh, and and this is the depiction as we know it today. Um, so the Pacific Plate, the, the the Arabian Plate, the African Plate, and you can see that, that this is not continent. Here's a continent. Here's Africa within here, and that's why it's named the African Plate. But it includes part of the ocean. And everywhere we find these boundaries, we find this topography right here's the African Plate right here. Right, the African Plate has one long divergent boundary off to its left. Um, and then a convergent boundary over in here, over in here, and it's the same for all the big ones. You can just kind of follow them just by looking for the topographic features. And ultimately gives us this cross section that, that you're now familiar with. We can have volcanic islands, um, we can have mountains on shore, we can have trenches. Um, a, a convergent boundary causes trenches, which essentially uh, cause the deepest parts in the ocean. Or we can have these long stretches of nothingness, which are usually on either side of a convergent or a di and a divergent. Right. So here's a mid-ocean ridge. This would be a divergent boundary. Here's a trench that would be convergent, and in between is these long stretches of abyssal plain, which I said make up a quarter of the Earth's surface. Okay. Thanks for joining me. See you next lesson.